five o'clock, but we are waiting on um, at least one other commissioner and other individuals to join. So uh, I'm gonna give it a few minutes. Hello. Hi, Seth. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine. That's good. Hi, Maureen. Ta -da, there I am. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so uh, I guess I'll kind of get going after I ask. So Jeff, I know Ian will not be making it. Uh, do you know about um, Linda or Dave? Uh, I'm having to send Linda a phone number. She's still on the road and doesn't have internet access at the moment. So she's going to try to call in and I have not heard from, from Dave. Okay. Um, well, I will, uh, begin the meeting since we do have quorum, um, and we have a fair amount of continuances to go through. So, um, welcome everybody to the October 28th Nantucket Conservation Commission meeting. Uh, we are meeting entirely remotely. Uh, via Zoom. So just uh, be careful not to uh, screen share your computer as anything uh, you share might be captured by the recording. Uh, in addition to that, when you are not speaking, uh, please remember to uh, mute your phone or your device uh, so that um, extraneous noise is not picked up by the recording. Um, uh, just as kind of a reminder uh, for members of the public, please make sure you state your name uh, and just speak clearly so that everything can be captured uh, by the meeting recording and we can have accurate minutes. Um, so with that, I will go through uh, tonight's continuances. Um, and I'm gonna apologize ahead of time because the dog is making a lot of noise and I don't know if you guys can hear it, but she's probably gonna make herself heard tonight. Um, so under notices of intent, uh, we have Lower Pacamo Nominee Trust at 88 Pacamo Road, continued until November 18th. We have Pacamo Point Realty Trust at 90 Pacamo Road, continued until November 18th. NISDA at 55 Walwinet Road is continued until November 18th. Uh, and then we have 8 Walsh LLC at 8 Walsh Street, continued until uh, November 18th. Uh, and then under amended orders of conditions, we have Scannell at 119R Eel Point Road, also continued until November 18th. I believe those are all of our continuances. Uh, so we will begin tonight uh, with Warren's Landing Nominee Trust at 40 Warren's Landing Road. Uh, and this is a withdrawal. So we just need to uh, make a motion to accept that withdrawal. So moved. All right, so motion made by Seth. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. All right. So that uh, carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Gilbert at 16 D Street, uh, represented by Don Bracken. I'm not sure if he's on yet. So Don is having some trouble. He's in one of the areas of Massachusetts affected by the storm where they are having internet difficulties. Um, he, he contacted me earlier and said he's gonna try to get on. So I would say if we run into one of Don's, um, if we could maybe carry it to the end for a little bit and then see, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, uh, that sounds good. So we will, um, 
wait on 16 D Street and hope that Don makes it on. Uh, and we will uh, move on to Lloyd Realty LLC at 7 Heather Lane, represented by Paul Santos. And this is a lot quicker than I thought it would be, but I'm here. Um, so could I just check? So um, based on the last meeting, do we have a, a quorum or who's actually has, did everyone sit on this one previously, Ashley? Because this is a continuation from last meeting. Um, I believe, Maureen, were you at the last meeting? Um, yes. yes. Yes, I was. Okay. Yeah. So we should be good. We're good. Okay. So we have, um, okay, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. For the record, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors on behalf of the current property owner, Lloyd Realty LLC. Uh, this is a continuation of a notice of intent um, hearing for a, a new application in which we were applying um, for construction of a single family dwelling, patio and associated grading, landscaping and utility insulation within the buffer zone to a coastal bank. Um, the site is located at seven Heather Lane, uh, which is a essentially a dead end road that meets Kimball Avenue, but does not connect to Kimball Avenue. And the site is accessed via Cliff Road and Hinkley Lane. Um, a few of the members did uh, attend a site visit on Monday. Um, and I appreciate uh, you all making it out there to do that. Uh, after the last meeting, we had some specific questions with regard to um, the erosion rate um, of the adjacent shoreline and also some specifics with regard to a proposed patio uh, that we had proposed um, previously. Um, the plan that you have before you depicts um, the patio, uh, lawn interface between the patio and a, the coastal bank, and then We've also um, have a essentially stepping stones or a patio lawn grid component uh, that was incorporated into the original design. Uh, the patio as originally submitted was, was much larger. Uh, there were some concerns um, from the abutter to the um, east, uh, Mr. Wolf that Arthur Reed had represented. Um, we did make some um, changes to that application actually just before the last meeting. Um, the, the layout that you have before you tonight is essentially um, the same as it was um, as we discussed at the last meeting. Uh, with regard to uh, the erosion rate, uh, that was an issue to um, confirm that we were subject to the 50 foot uh, no build and it did not rise to the next level when we started looking at that 20, the provision of 20 times the, the existing erosion rate. Uh, the erosion rate in this area is approximately 0 0.62 um, feet per year based on the CZM shoreline change mapping. Um, so based on that, um, we feel uh, it is a stable bank in that the 50 foot setback is um, applicable for this particular piece of property. We also provided some detail with regard to the, the patio area, um, specifically uh, provided a, a design layout of the of what is typically done for what we would consider a pervious patio, which is a dry laid patio um, with a stone base and um, spacing of the um, actual um, flagstone um, rectangular flagstone pieces. Uh, so, our in opinion, again, um, it is a uh, considered basically a it is set up to be a pervious. Um, component um, within uh, for the particular patio area. Uh, the patio does occur within the 50 foot setback. The dwelling is outside of the 50 foot setback. Uh, the application that you have before you um, does not require any waivers uh, from your regulations. Um, the there has also been there is some um, pictures of both the stepping stone grid layout and um, a sample pervious patio has been submitted as part of um, as part of the application. Um, um, as I said, we did have a site walk out there. Um, the site is essentially vacant. Uh, the existing stairs, there is an existing set of beach stairs that was permitted previously um, through with a valid order of conditions. Uh, and other than that, the site is um, an open site. 
Um, for those of us who were there the other day, there has been some filling that occurred, I believe, when they removed the existing single family dwelling that was closer to Heather Lane. Um, but it appears that, in my opinion, the filling has occurred uh, in the lower portion of the lot. Uh, which is actually outside of CONCOM jurisdiction, outside of the 100-foot setback associated with the, um, with the Coastal Bank. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission or anybody else um, participating in the hearing may have. Uh, we do have a DEP file number, and it is outside of jurisdiction um, with regard to uh, NHESP. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple minor things. First is that I think we should require, um, I, I get that the pervious, the patio is designed as pervious, but filling in the cracks with P-stone makes it less pervious. So I think we should just require um, drainage system that takes the water away from the coastal bank as well, just to make sure we're not putting excess water into the coastal bank. And then the second thing we noticed on the um, site visit is that there appeared to be unpermitted brush cutting that took place. Not sure by who, but uh, we should just indicate in the order that no brush cutting is allowed and it will be subject to enforcement if we see it again. Thank you, Seth. Um, that uh, Vista pruning was definitely evident on our site visit. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Um, I know, Paul, I was having trouble after the site visit when I got home and was looking at the plan a little bit better, visualizing the house and just where that sits like on the existing topography. So are you guys gonna bring in fill to raise up that area around the house? Can you kind of explain that a little bit? Sure, um, the actual area, the top of the bluff actually would not be, the house is being constructed at that elevation. Um, the, the house is actually being uh, built forward of the top portion of the bluff. So um, as you walk down that slope or up the slope, depending upon how you're coming, if you're coming from the from Heather Lane and walking up that slope, their fill, the fill would be placed um, towards Heather Lane. Um, there would be no fill placed um, from basically the 50 foot setback uh, to the coastal bank and so forth. They're, they're essentially building the house um, at that plateau. To give you an example, the, the finished grade as you walk out of the back of the dwelling, um, the patio is shown as 50. That matches existing grade that's out there today. So that, that upper plateau stays the same. The, the first floor elevation would be elevated up and then the house would, the fill would be, occur to the south uh, or the Heather Lane side of the dwelling. There's actually, um, there would be a cut actually to the west um, and there'd be a small cut also uh, to the east because the plateau uh, is in the middle of the lot and then the property to the east and to the west uh, rise up a bit and would be staying down lower on that existing grade. Um, so to answer your question, there's no fill being placed at the top um, of that, of the bluff. That's basically, we're matching that grade and working everything forward. Okay, but there is a, a significant amount of fill between the 50 and 100 that'll be needed to construct the house. Yes, but for the most part, it'll be the house. Okay. You know, I mean, the house will be essentially be where the what's taking up that area, and then what would be filled with the majority of the fill would be actually outside the hundred foot buffer, because the house essentially between the fifty and the hundred, for the most part, is all going to be foundation, and then that's going to, that's going to be the actual structure. Okay, I was just having trouble picturing that because there was like some significant topographical changes and either side kind of had not trenching, but at what I would kind of describe as almost, you know, low spots or trenching. So thank you for uh, explaining that. Um, so if there are no 
other questions or comments from commissioners at this point, I'll open it up for public comment. Um, do we have members of the public who would like to comment on this application? Looks like not on the Zoom call. No YouTube comments as well, Madam Chair. No YouTube comments either. Okay, thank you. I'm having trouble toggling my, my screens today. Um, all right, so Jeff, do we have everything we would need to close this one? You have all of the required information, yes, ma'am. Okay. Paul, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? So moved. Uh, I think Seth got you with his hand. Uh, second. All right, so I'll give Seth the motion and Linda the second. Um, by roll vote, uh, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that uh, carries unanimously. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and that moves us on to 22 Easton Street, LLC at 22 and 24 Easton Street, represented by Brian Madden. Good evening. Um, Brian Madden from the uh, representing the applicant. Uh, we had uh, initially presented this uh, project at the last meeting, uh, but uh, the packet hadn't been uploaded to the website, so I don't think everyone got an opportunity to uh, review it in earnest. And uh, just to hit some highlights or reiterate a few points, it's redevelopment of the property. Uh, the property is within flood zone, transitioning from a velocity zone within the uh, along the harbor uh, to an AE elevation seven. Um, no proposed structural components are within the velocity zone. It's all within the um, AE7. And um, the proposed redevelopment, all structures are located greater than uh, 50 feet from the coastal bank behind the uh, bulkhead uh, along the harbor. Um, everything has been designed in compliance with flood zone standards. Uh, structures are going to sit on shallow crawl space foundations with flood vents. Uh, first floor elevations will be 8.25. Um, so the interests of flood control and storm damage prevention are being protected. And um, I guess I'll turn over to questions at this point. Thank you, Brian. Um, looks like Mark has a question or comment. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Uh, that 22 Eastern Street is not downloading onto my, onto my computer. It comes up blank. It downloads a PDF. The PDF is blank. Anybody else sharing that problem? I was able to see this one. Okay. I, I did check it the other day to confirm as much. <laughs> we had that issue last time. Okay. Um, all right. Any uh, other kind of questions or comments? I'm sorry about that. Mark technology can really be a blessing and a curse. It just downloaded. Do we, would you like to table this or give it some thought? Uh, let me just look for a minute here. Okay. Um, well, if there are no questions from commissioners at this point, I, I can open it up to members of the public who might have comments on this one. Dog has a question. Oh yeah, I, I knew she was going to make some noise today. Too many rainy days in a row. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mark, I do just have one quick question. Can you tell me, Brian, uh, which structures will be raised and which ones will not? I'm just giving it a quick look now, and you could help me with that. Yeah, um, Jeff, I don't know if you can pull up that plan again. I'm lo I'm looking at it, so I'm okay. But whatever. okay, so. This this is uh, Blackwell's plan that shows the overlay 
um, the the darker kind of yellowish is proposed if you can see the outline of the the prior structures um, in uh, it has a cross shaded edging to it. And then there's a deck that goes um, further landward in some areas. Um, we had also submitted a landscape plan that shows a little bit more detail on a few um, proposed project details. But the, um, the, the main structure is somewhat in place. And then the um, there's a guest cottage that's uh, being replaced. Okay, yeah. So that that gives the final proposed conditions with a little bit more detail. But basically, the um, proposed structures, the redeveloped structures for what is being removed and replaced, are basically uh, nearly in the same footprint. Just so slight orientation change to it. Make it a little bit more parallel to the to the property lines, side property lines. Jeff, do you have a question or comment? No, I, I think to, to maybe help answer Mark's question, Mark, I think from the plan, and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, the main house, the studio, and the guest house that we're looking on in the plan will all be raised uh, to be compliant with the flood zone the garage structure is the structure that's the slab on grade. Correct. That will have the, like the flood venting. That's how I understood the project. Yep. Yeah. The garage is up uh, closer towards Easton street. All right. I think we're probably good with the plan. I have one follow up, uh, Ashley, if I may. Yep. Go ahead. Um, Brian, uh, I'm, not concerned, but I'm wondering how you will organize the base of the pool when you're in an area where the groundwater is probably pretty close, I would think, to the surface. And it says a pool. Uh, um, how will you control the, the base of, of that pool so it won't float out uh, when we get uh, a lot of water pressure in there from the rising, rising tide, let alone rising sea level? Yeah, so at least during construction, uh, do anticipate some level of dewatering out to uh, catch basins in Easton Street uh, in coordination with uh, DPW and uh, Natural Resources Office. Um, you know, permanent um, stabilization, um, you know, typical to kind of a waterproof tight um, basement foundation you typically would install, um, you know, the groundwater here is somewhat uh, fluctuated by the tide, obviously. Um, and so it'd be very similar to that watertight basement type foundation. I guess my concern, Brian, was that I know with, with the white elephant pool, when it was there, they were very concerned they could never empty it because it would pop out of the ground. Yeah, um, having worked on, um, a pool replacement project further down Holbert Ave, um, you know, there would be a scenario if there would be any repairs that there's just a drawdown uh, in inserting, I believe what they're doing there is point source wells just to draw it down uh, and then make the repairs in place. But uh, that pool, um, you know, it didn't have any issues with it popping out. It's just more maintenance issues and, and ground, groundwater seepage. But that, that's a much older pool. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Just one, Madam Chairman. I'm on my phone, so I can't raise my hand. Uh, yes, go ahead, Linda. Um, it may be a stupid question, but given the flooding <laughs> that had just occurred, we had it down here in New Jersey as well, Given the flooding that just occurred and you've got wash over, I know they have a fairly good bulkhead there. They replaced that some time ago. What happens, there aren't too many pools on that side of Easton Street and the white elephant pool is gone now. What happens when you get wash over 
that goes through the pool that takes the chlorinated pool water and shoves it down Easton Street? I mean, is that a dumb question? No, um, uh, through the chair. I mean, I don't. The, the pool is not intended to be chlorinated. It's, it's intended to be a saltwater pool, but, um, you know, it is such a, you know, small amount in the larger ocean scheme of things. Um, you know, if anything, the pool, because it is slightly depressed and, you know, there is some gap between the top water level and the top of the pool, it's actually more of a collection point than a, you know, it's just all going to blend and spill over um, type of uh, effect. But um, again, the intent would it, for it to be a saltwater pool and, um, you know, any perceived intermixing of waters would be, you know, a drop in the ocean, so to speak, in comparison. So, okay, Brian thanks. It was just something that I had to ask, given what's happened over the last couple of days. Yeah, so Brian, I appreciate you saying it's a saltwater pool, but I do think that ends up being a little confusing to people because it still is using chemical treatment. It's not like yeah. ocean water salt makeup. It's using, you know, chlorine from salt to treat the pool. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that's kind of an important distinction. And uh, Linda, that is a great question. So not, not stupid at all. Um, yeah, and I would, uh, sorry, just to jump in. Um, so I think a, a lot of these um, storm events would be more in your shoulder seasons where the pool would already be drawn down a little bit uh, out of season uh, and certainly would anticipate the same level of conditions um, for, for that sort of dewatering offsite um, through truck. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Seth, I saw your hand going up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think it is important to note, as you said, that saltwater pools are chlorinated. You don't add chlorine tablets to them, but they um, chlorinated water comes from the filter system. And yeah, the salt water is about like 10 times less salty than the ocean. So it's still need pool chemicals to maintain a healthy pool environment there. Um, some accounts say that saltwater pools actually are more detrimental because they require more maintenance, but um, we'll leave that to the pool experts. But I think it's time that we start to look at what our regulations for land under the ocean, or sorry, land, land subject to coastal storm flowage say. And in there's two performance standards, performance standard one and performance standard four that are potentially relevant in these types of areas. Um, and maybe performance standard two as well. So I'll just read them out. One is the work shall not reduce the ability of the land to absorb and contain floodwaters or buffer inland areas from flooding and wave damage. Two is projects shall not cause ground, surface, or saltwater pollution triggered by co coastal storm flowage. And four is building upon areas subject to coastal storm flowage in locations where such such structure would be subject to storm damage may not be permitted. I don't know how we've really um, used those regulations in the past to consider pools in uh, flood prone areas, but maybe we need to consider them more fully. Um, something, something to think about for the commission. Thank you, Seth. Thank you for reading those conditions. I think that's very important. Uh, Brian, were you saying something? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, it, it, we did take a look at those uh, performance standards and, and feel that the pool itself, again, being slightly depressed, um, is not going to displace or redirect floodwaters offsite. I, I think if the, the pool was elevated with a lip above existing grade, then I think that argument could be made uh, whereas if we're at grade or below grade, um, it's not going to displace or redirect. Um, and again, with that, um, you know, slightly uh, water level below the surrounding lip of the pool, 
um, you know, is going to function in some capacity to absorb and contain some floodwaters um, in comparison to existing. Um, the entirety of the project is designed in consideration or compliance with uh, flood zone building standards uh, to buffer the inland areas from flooding and wave damage. Um, so we, we did take a look at those, those performance standards and initially the pool was going to be elevated above um, existing grade and we changed that so it would be at grade. Thank you, Brian. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners, Mark? I'm still troubled by some of the comments about uh, the pool water escaping. Uh, and it's, it's not even, I mean, it's, it's more than a flood area. It's a high tide area nowadays. We get a really high water uh, tide, a storm high water. Uh, that area is underwater. Um, and I'm, I'm troubled by two things. First of all, the water escaping from the pool, which is chemical water. And also, I don't know what... Uh, how it'll appear if we approve something that I think is in a perilous position uh, to fail. Uh, I know that when they redid the uh, lobster trap next to Killen Real Estate, they put a massive concrete uh, foundation under the house to prevent it from, uh, from uh, popping up in a, in a heavy, heavy storm uh, with a super high tide. Uh, and I haven't heard any comment about putting in a, uh, a massive foundation underneath the pool to keep it from, uh, from, from coming up in a, in a uh, floating up in a storm in high water. I'm just troubled by it. it. We're approving a pool in an area where I just am not sure pools should be for a variety of reasons. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, the definition of pollution is introduction of contaminants into the natural environment. And we can debate about the scale or whether it's a drop in the bucket or not, but that's not the, really what's important here. I think it's important to examine is, do we think the project has proposed going to cause pollution or not? And if it's going to cause any amount of pollution, it's within our interests um, that are protected to try to see the project altered to prevent pollution. So it's worth, worth considering uh, potential redesigns for the pool. Thank you, Seth. Um, I definitely share commissioner's concerns about the pool um, because I do think there, there will be, you know, mixing of the pool water with flood water and um, I do imagine at least some pollution leaving uh, during a flood situation. Um, so that's kind of my perspective. I'm also curious, um, I mean, the site's definitely getting developed pretty heavily and I'm wondering if the landscaping is also kind of flood tolerant landscaping um, or if it's more ornamental um, because I do worry about like the survivability and sustainability at this site. Yeah, um, so the landscaping hasn't been designed or completed just yet, but we have talked about um, certainly it would have to be a native uh, complement of species that are more salt spray uh, tolerant. Um, you know, I would ask that the commission condition it that a final planting plan and scheme would need to be uh, subject to further review and and um, approval uh, either from the full commission or by staff. And then uh, relative to the, the pool aspects in a storm event, I mean, we can condition it or, or propose to draw down at the end of the season and or in, a, uh, in advance of any storm events that there wouldn't be an intermixing of, of any pool waters with, with flood waters. That could be more of a containment, um, if anything. Um, and I, if the commission would be willing to condition in that manner, so it'd be drained in an event, a uh, storm event. Okay. I have you. a question, Madam Chair. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Vis-a-vis um, -vis what 
uh, Brian just said, I'm wondering if a condition could be placed. I don't have a problem with the rest of the project, uh, just the pool, because there are no pools on that side of the road that I can find um, offhand. Um, if we could put a condition in any uh, order of conditions that it be uh, be drained, period, by September 15th and not refilled, period, until like June 15th. I mean, are those things are allowed? Would that make sense? Um, I think I just wonder some pools I know are meant to hold water now. So I guess that's a pool maintenance question. Um, but I'm sure we could condition it. Yeah. We would be amenable to a condition um, along those lines. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Linda, for suggesting that. Um, any other comments or questions from commissioners? All right, looks like no. So we'll open it up uh, to public comment. Uh, is there any public comment at this point? Uh, RJ? Thank you, Chair Erisman. Can you hear me? Yes. So RJ Turcott for Nantucket Land Council. Um, Agree with Commissioner Engelborg on the land subject to coastal storm flowage performance standards, specifically number four. Uh, if you read that directly and dryly as it's written, it looks like it's not possible to meet it if there are new structures there because the commission would all have to find, you would all have to agree that those structures wouldn't be subject to storm damage in that area. So uh, that's sort of our thoughts. Of a little disappointed Ian isn't here because uh, he'd have some insight as well with the coastal resilience plan coming out this week and uh, some in new information available to the commissioners in that neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you, RJ. Um, it doesn't look like we have any uh, public comment on YouTube. Um, Jeff, do we have everything we would need to close this one? Uh, you have all of the required information, yes. Okay. Um, so Brian, I guess my question to you is, uh, would you like to try and close tonight or would you like to look at some of the pool design aspects a little bit closer? Um, if I could ask through the chair, if um, uh, commission members are comfortable uh, conditioning uh, in, in along what we discussed on a seasonal basis in an event in advance of uh, any predicted storm events. Um, um, I know along with the along with the starting and the stopping of that pool completely. Yeah, we're not talking about draining um, completely, but down to a level that is not going to create a mixing type of effect, correct? Uh, basically. Sure. Um, I know I am uncomfortable with a pool in this location. I think it's a, a, a recipe for trouble given um, current flooding conditions down there because we have a lot of summer storms now that as well flood that area. So um, I am uncomfortable with the pool. I, I'm not sure if other uh, commissioners uh, want to share. Maureen? Um, yeah, this is, um, I hadn't, I am not a pool expert by any means, and I hadn't realized that, I guess I thought saltwater pools were, were essentially ocean water, and now I, once again, I uh, think at every meeting I learned something, and this, this is quite significant, um, and the, the fact that, that a number of my fellow commissioners have questions and, I'm, and I, I think this is something that we simply need to have more information about because I share the general concern that having a pool that is, that is actually apparently more chemical than the typical chlor chlorinated pool um, in that area seems to be, um, you know, as you said, asking for trouble. So I, I share uh, my fellow commissioners' discomfort and and thinking that 
we need to have um, more information before I certainly would feel comfortable um, approving this. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Mark? I share your concerns, Ashley. Okay. Um, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wanna like the condition that Brian's proposing, but I'm wary of the logistics because um, storms sometimes are unexpected and pool companies, especially in the summer are busy here and um, making sure that the pool can get drained, let's say on less than 24 hours notice uh, might, might not always work. Uh, I think, you know, if you have someone on retainer, it probably, probably will be able to be done, but I don't want there to be contingencies in place where if it doesn't get drained and we get a big unexpected storm, you're having issues. Um, I think having like the seasonal drainage makes total sense. And I think the idea of having a drain before each storm is good, but I'm wary of the logistics. And I think that alternatives that exist such as above ground pools haven't been considered here. So maybe that's something to, to look into. Thank you, Seth. Um, so Brian, what, what would you like to do in this case? Yeah, no, thank you everyone. Uh, really appreciate all the comments. And um, just, um, I, I think for now, given you know the major hang up is the pool um, and a little bit more homework would be required to get everyone to a comfort level uh, for trigger mechanisms and logistics of figuring that all out. I, I would like to um, uh, pull, pull the pool from the application. And um, if we can condition it that the pool is not approved, we can immediately submit uh, revised plans uh, but we would like to close because I, I think they are anxious to start work on the property. Um, okay, thank you, Brian. I think, Jeff, that's easily doable, correct? Yes, it, you would just simply, the, the project description, uh, not include the pool, and then I would specifically call out probably a finding that says the pool as shown on the plan of record is not approved by this order of conditions, and then they could come back if... Um, they went further, they could come back with an amended order of conditions request to replace that, or they could do a whole new filing if they wish to pursue that as an option. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And Mark, I saw your hand up, go ahead. Yes, yeah, just, uh, I was been mentioned several times about a landscape plan. Would that be something that staff would approve or should we have a whack at that? Um, I know I always like looking at landscape plans um, and Seth is pretty good at, at picking out um, baddies from those plant lists. So I think it would be good for us to review. Yeah, if we could do that. Would that be minor, separate? Minor modification process, would that be acceptable? Yeah. Yes, I think that's fine. Yeah, or I would say if you're gonna come back for further discussion on the pool and amendment, you could also just combine it with that as well. If you were okay. interested. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, Linda, were you trying to say something? No, I just wanted to see if we could combine the hardscape with the pool, and I that's already been suggested, so. Okay, uh, perfect. Um, well, it sounds like Brian would like to close uh, removing the kind of pool at this point from the project, so is there a, a motion to close? I'll make that motion. Uh, Mark beat you with his hand, uh, but I'll give you that. My, my, mo my motion will be subject to a landscape plan being approved by us. Is that That's okay? Coming we'll anyway we'll do that during the order of conditions. Yeah, that'll go in. Yeah. Thank um, you all. Happy to, happy to close. All right. So Mark made the motion. Linda gets the second. Uh, I roll vote. Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right. That carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Um, and that moves us on to Kane at 12 Pond Road, also represented by Brian Madden. Uh, apologies, but uh, we would like to uh, request a continuance on this one as well to the, what is it, 18th? The 18th, yes, we've got uh, three weeks on this one. Um, all right, so Kane at 12 Pond Road will continue until November 18th. Uh, and that will move us on to Eat Fire Spring Trust 2018 at 12 Margaret's Way 
represented by Art Gasparo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm before you with the second public hearing for this application, uh, which was primarily around a, um, a septic system upgrade and um, construction of a shed and perhaps future cottage in the buffer zone uh, as a sort of a phase one, phase two type approach. Um, I don't believe there were any outstanding questions at the last commission meeting, but we were waiting for Natural Heritage and we have received their sign off. I'd be happy to uh, address any additional questions that you may have. Thank you, Art. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. So let's give a quick check to the public. Um, are there any questions about this project from the public? Looks like not on YouTube. Um, so Jeff, I believe, um, as Art said, we have everything we need to close this one? Yes, you do. Okay. Art, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? So move. I'll move. Uh, so Maureen gets the motion. Linda, I'll give you the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Neil. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Finley at 26 Eel Point Road, represented by Brian Madden. Thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden, for the record. Uh, this project uh, was approved by the commission um, back in 2014, sorry, 2004. Uh, an order was issued for a very similar uh, development. Um, I had gone back out there and um, reflagged the isolated vegetated wetland uh, within the northwesterly portion of the site. Uh, the boundary did uh, modify uh, slightly uh, more up gradient than what was approved back in 2004. And uh, initially there was a proposed uh, tennis court uh, that was proposed in the south easterly, sorry, southwesterly portion of the site. Uh, that was ultimately revised to be a game court uh, to maintain the, the 50 foot setback uh, to the vegetated wetland boundary. Uh, there's a perimeter drain around that um, uh, sports court, uh, basically just half of a, a regular size tennis court. Um, the proposed project was slightly modified to ensure that no structural components were within the 50 foot buffer zone. Uh, there's a pretty significant topographic change from the vegetated wetland up to where the proposed uh, main dwelling is located uh, and it's really just the uh, tennis court, now game court, uh, the main house, some landscaping um, and regrading that occur within the 100 foot buffer zone to that uh, vegetated wetland. The septic system is already in place. There's a cottage in the far back portion of the lot and uh, the remaining aspects are located uh, outside the 100 foot buffer zone um, no structural components within the 50 foot, uh, drainage, uh, for the house is being directed to a series of dry wells. Um, and, um, there's a two foot separation of high groundwater for the proposed main dwelling and, um, and no waivers are required for the project. And so I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, so we'll open it up. Um, if there are any questions from the public on Finley 2060. Also seems pretty quiet. Uh, oh. Sorry, just for clarification purposes, this is a, um, uh, a bylaw protected only vegetated wetland, uh, no state jurisdictional wetlands on or off site within 100 feet. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, 
Jeff, do we have everything we would need to close? We did. We were very quick with our file numbers on the applicant to get those issued. So, um, Thank you. So at this point, seeing that there's no questions, is there a motion to close? Motion made by Mark. Is there a I'll second? second? Seconded I'll by second. Um, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Ack Sandy LLC at 6 Sandy Drive, also represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Brian Madden for the record. Uh, proposed project involves uh, renovating uh, existing single family dwelling, uh, relocating it and uh, elevating it with some proposed additions. Um, there's a, a boring vegetated wetland system uh, to the south, southeast uh, portion of that BVW minimally encroaches onto the property. And um, so currently uh, portions of the dwelling uh, do not comply with uh, side yard setbacks. Um, the proposed structures will comply. Uh, and basically it's just picking up the house, which is currently um, not in compliance with current flood zone standards. Um, the existing first floor elevation is at 6.6, .6, the proposed, um, is uh, 10.1. And so it is going to be placed on a elevated peer support foundation uh, to increase uh, capacity for storm damage uh, prevention and flood control. Uh, we are proposing to increase the setbacks to the uh, vegetated wetland uh, to the greatest extent feasible. Um, the majority of the proposed structures are outside the 50 foot buffer zone and or separated um, from the vegetated wetland by the existing structure. Um, we're proposing to um, make some site improvements. Um, under existing conditions, the structural setbacks to the wetland is 4.1 linear feet. That's being increased to 23.4 linear feet. Of uh, removing 137 square feet of proposed structure within the 25 foot buffer zone. Uh, and there's an overall 170 square foot reduction in the 50 foot buffer zone. Uh, the patio that's behind the house is being uh, slightly reconfigured. So it's increasing its setbacks to the vegetated wetland. Uh, the AC units and propane tank, which are currently in the 50 foot buffer zone are proposed to be relocated outside the 50. Um, and again, as I indicated, they are reconstructing the dwelling on a flood compliant peer supported foundation. And uh, we are proposing to um, revegetate uh, existing lawn areas, um, majority of which are in the 25 foot buffer zone, but also partially within uh, the vegetated wetland extends into the lawn area minimally. And so we're proposing to revegetate those with um, more salt tolerant uh, plant species being groundsel tree bush, bayberry, uh, beach plum, and seaside goldenrod. Um, so the overall project has been designed to avoid adverse impacts uh, and will result in a significant long-term net uh, benefit improvement over existing conditions. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Maureen? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through the chair, uh, Brian, the, the thing when I'm looking at that, I was surprised to see that they were retaining, um, I, there's a, a redoing though, but retaining the patio on the south, you know, where the original patio was, I guess, on the south, south-ish side of the structure. Um, and they're adding another porch on in the new construction, which is outside um, 
the 50, but they're keeping, they're redoing the patio within the 50. And I, um, given the fact that, that um, this property, you know, is there, you're go there's going to have to be things done. Um, and obviously uh, in order to bring this into compliance anyway, I don't see how retaining that patio um, fits into um, you know, our rule book. Um, it's, I don't see that it's necessary. There's going to be another one on the other side of the house. Um, so there's, that's an alternative right there. And, um, and I would think that bringing as much as possible the area within the 50 back into um, as far as possible, a normal vegetated position would be superior to putting in, putting in a, a new construction there in lieu of the old patio. So I have a, I have a, <clears throat> I have a problem with that and I would be interested to hear your comments. Thank you. Yeah. I know. Thank you uh, for the comments. Uh, so the in initial intent here was just to, um, with the house being pushed back as further to the north as possible, that's compliant, compliant with um, side yard setbacks and allowing for the proposed additions outside the 50 foot. Um, you know, basically the patio uh, would be coming with um, that relocated structure footprint. Um, and really it would just involve some reconfiguration uh, beyond existing. So the closest portion, uh, the closest portion of the patio towards the vegetated wetland would be removed. Uh, we are proposing to remove that entire uh, stockade fence around that's currently around the patio. Mm -hmm. um, and the the patio is is proposed in that location because there's a that stoop access way coming off of the um, the house currently. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, and I can confirm with the architect whether or not there's some give to relocate that. Uh, porch entryway, which would then possibly provide some latitude to move it outside the, the 25 foot buffer zone. I just don't know logistically or architecturally if that's feasible. I can certainly ask that question, but the intent was just to kind of keep it all moving and, and relocate it as far back away from the wetlands as feasible. Um, may I have a follow up, please? Uh, yes, Maureen, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so now I, I better understand that I didn't, this, the stoop was a little hard to see, um, but the, and I understand, and it's obviously it's a good thing they're moving the house and putting that, <clears throat> excuse me, making that compliant with the, uh, the storm flowage issues, but the um, retaining the entire uh amount of the patio within the 25, and I was, I misspoke before I did me, I meant with, within the 25 and not just the 50. Um, you know, obviously to remove as much as possible from within the 25, um, again, if they need to have an entryway there, that's one thing, but to retain um, this, you know, patio there within, you know, uh, within the 25, any more than it's absolutely necessary for an entryway or some specific purpose other than having a patio where it would never, otherwise never be allowed. Um, and the fact that they are adding a porch to the Northern part, and there does seem to be other alternatives of places to, um, to be outside in a, um, you know, in a, somewhat more constructed environment, I still, I, I have a problem with the amount there. Um, and so that's, that's one thing I, 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 I think that should be reduced to the, to the minimum. Um, and if I may, I have another question. One of the photographs showing the current foundation, it looked like it was, um, you know, kind of new uh, that I, I was assuming this was, this had been around for a while and the 
the, the existing foundation looks like it's all new wood and stuff. And maybe I'm just not seeing that right. But I was wondering, had they just done something to the foundation already? And then now they realize they have to raise it. I just, it just seemed odd to me to see something that was so new yet, um, but isn't compliant. And so maybe it's not as new as I think it is, but I would, I would like to know what the story is behind that. Yep. Um, thanks for the questions to the chair. Um, we can certainly look at the pa patio closer and see what we can do to relocate that outside the 25 foot. Um, re relative to the foundation and some of the wood underneath the structure. Um, yeah, I see what you're seeing there. I, I don't know if there was some renovation maintenance work that previously took place. Um, it, it does seem to be kind of a mix, maybe some newer wood and mm -hmm. some, maybe some patchwork, um, done. Uh, I, I don't think any significant work had been recently completed, but the, the applicants had recently just brought, bought the property. Um, but we can ask that question, but at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be a much significant improvement over existing. Okay. I, I, cause I wanted to be sure there wasn't something that had happened that should have been dealt with. Um, and I do understand this obviously is going to look much different when after the, the building is moved and the new um, foundation is put under it. So um, thank you, Brian. No problem. Thank you, Maureen. Mark, I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you, Ashley. Uh, am, am I looking at it correctly, Brian, and that part of the new addition is within the 50 foot? Uh, a small sliver is that overlaps with the uh, existing footprint of the existing house. Thank because you. Of the, because of the fact that we have to rotate it slightly to maximize that separation and comply with the side yard setbacks, it, it minimally brings it into the, the 50, but it again overlaps with existing. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mark, for your question. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Mark? I guess along those lines, actually, uh, it, it would appear that uh, the proposed addition, uh, I'm seeing it's got little bumps there along the north end, which probably requires, uh, it's within the setback. I mean, it's just outside the setback line now, but uh, the addition may be, uh, as big as they want it, but maybe not as big as they can have because they move the house another two or three feet, they would be out of the 50 foot, uh, which I think would uh, improve the application from my standpoint. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. I, I, I would have to agree with this sort of kind of redevelopment and house moving um, to see all new construction outside of the 50 would be good. Um, and I also um, hear Maureen's concerns about that patio being reconstructed within the 25, um, as we, we do wanna increase separation there even further uh, would be my feeling, yeah. Um, so if there are no other comments or questions from commissioners, we'll open it up to the public. Let's see if there's any public comment on this one. Looks like we do not have public comment. Um, so Brian, would you like to um, try and close tonight or would you like to try and uh, do a little bit of pencil sharpening? Yeah, um, we would like to continue to the 18th. I also don't think we have a file number yet. Okay. No. The next three we do not have file numbers for. This one or the next two. Missed that one. So, um, all right, this will continue then until November 18th. All right, thanks everyone. We'll look into those comments. Cool. Thank you, Brian. So, real, um, real quickly, Madam Chair, uh, yep. Don Bracken was able to get in touch with me and has asked to just continue that 16 D Street application. Okay, so uh, Gilbert at 16 D Street will continue until November 18th. Yes, Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, so that moves us on uh, to 11 Woodbury Lane Realty Trust at 11 Woodbury Lane, represented by Brian Madden. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental. 
Um, uh, I think we all know this property. Um, it was destroyed by the explosion fire in November 2020. Um, <clears throat> the basement foundation and some remnant concrete structural components remain. I submitted some photographs of existing conditions, uh, but it's taken a little bit of time to, um, uh, to get to this point uh, for a number of reasons. But um, so the, the applicant uh, owners are, are looking to reconstruct the single family dwelling. Uh, all the redevelopment occurs within uh, existing developed conditions. Um, the basement, the full ba basement foundation is being removed um, and it's gonna be replaced with a um, crawl space foundation for mechanicals only. Um, uh, there's gonna be 12 inches of clean stone gravel underlain for the sub base. Uh, there's going to be a hydrostatic pressure relief system, under drain system under uh, the foundation to mitigate any groundwater buildup. Um, while that um, full basement is being uh, removed um, and the new shallow or crawl space foundation is being replaced, any excess water is gonna be dewatered to catch basins uh, within Woodbury Lane in coordination with DPW and um, Natural Resources Department. Um, the so there's a, a vegetated wetland boundary, vegetated wetland uh, directly off site to the uh, northwest. Um, you can see flags one through two on this plan that's in front of you. Uh, from flag two, it basically uh, extends perpendicular uh, away from the property. Um, the applicant is proposing to improve site conditions over existing. Um, there is some minor structural redevelopment in the 50 foot, uh, mainly the uh, corner of the garage on slab, uh, which is um, the northwesterly corner of this proposed structure outlined in red here. Uh, the black is the, uh, yeah, the black is the um, existing or, or pre-existing. Um, there is an overall slight decrease in impervious surface within the 50 foot going from nine square feet to six. Um, the slab, garage, garage on slab will maintain a two foot separation of high groundwater. Um, runoff from the proposed structures will be redirected to uh, perimeter stone infiltration trenches. There's no substantive regrading proposed on the lot. Uh, all utilities will be reconnected and the, the property kind of slopes up uh, from the structures uh, gradually up towards uh, the vegetated wetland to the offsite. But the applicant is proposing to restore portions of the 25 foot buffer zone and a small portion outside the 25 within the 50 foot. We had submitted a uh, landscape plan uh, that shows 14 sweep pepper bush, uh, 18 rose mallow shrubs that are being uh, replaced, uh, 23 arrowwood, 27 bayberry, um, to effectively bring the, the property into compliance with the 50% uh, area uh, being naturally vegetated within the 25 to 50 foot. Um, and so in its entirety, the project has been designed to result in an improvement over those pre-existing site conditions. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I understand um, from the plan and your description about that uh, small corner of the stoop and the building that's gonna be proposed in the 50 foot um, buffer zone. It looks like maybe historically a very small portion of the existing foundation existed in the 50 foot, but it 
it's definitely less than what is proposed. Um, and I would just like to see that redesigned to try to get that small corner out of the 50 foot buffer zone. Uh, yeah, just for clarification, it's uh, proposed conditions is less. Um, the, on the plans, if you can see the, the past structural component, it, it was closer to the resource area and totaled 19 square feet versus six feet, that, that one corner. This is all landward or, or south of, um, there's an existing stone wall to, to remain. Um, again, the, the property slopes away from the wetland down gradient. And so this, this all occurs like in that corner where the um, uh, south of that retaining wall and uh, basically overlapping with the portion of the structure in the driveway area. Thank you, Brian. And thank, thank you, Seth, for your question. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, so we'll open it up uh, for public comment. Are there any questions from the public at this point? Uh, RJ? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Land Council, uh, we agree with Commissioner Engelbord's comments about the structure within the 50, especially in light of um, that house on the creeks that came through a couple of meetings back, the commission should really stick to a very black and white. If it is able to be reconfigured, it should be outside of the 50. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Um, I do tend to agree that um, new structure, you know, should be designed to be outside of the 50. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll be able to make that happen. Yeah, uh, we can look into it, certainly. Um, you know, th this is obviously a unique situation that um, we obviously didn't want to be before, um, you guys, with this application. Um, with a scenario like this, if we were to reconstruct within that same footprint, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily view this as total new, new construction. We have existing structural components on the ground um, and we are providing an improvement over existing conditions and and um, you know I had submitted some photographs of what that area specifically looks like um, you know certainly would recommend that anyone um, go to the site and take a look at that specific corner it, it's so immaterial to protection of the actual resource area uh, I understand, you know, commission trying to keep it consistent across the board, but there are some extenuating circumstances on this lot in, in the scenario um, for this application. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I totally understand the, the dynamics going on here. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, it does not look like we have any other public comment at this point. Um, so do commissioners have final thoughts before we continue this one? Uh, Mark? Just to give Brian a little clue, but I, I support the thought that they really should try to do a redesign and get that corner out of the 50 foot barrier. We've been trying to stick to it very stringently. And I think um, it's gotta be an awfully compelling reason to, to waive that and I don't see the compelling reason here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, all right, so with that, um, Brian- I have a comment, oh. Madam Chairman. Yep, go ahead, Linda. Um, I completely support their idea. I was up there multiple times. Uh, the person who was blown up in the house is a very close friend of mine. Um, the houses are set up in Woodbury to sort of match each other as far as setbacks and ground cover. That's front and back. And I am, I am not comfortable with telling them to change it now. So that's my personal opinion. Thank, thank you, Linda. Um, I guess fortunately and unfortunately, there's, you know, we're not asking them to change something on the ground. The house is gone. So, um, 
you know, if, if that original house were being constructed today, it, it would be outside the 50s. So, um, you know, I, I see all concerns, but sometimes whole developments get built too close to wetlands for, you know, whatever reason. Um, all right, so uh, if that is the last commissioner comment, we will continue this until November 18th. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, and that uh, moves us thank on you. to Nantucket Island's land bank at 13579 11, 13, 15, and 15A. My Comet Road, uh, and this is represented by Rachel Freeman. Good evening, my name is Rachel Freeman and I'm representing the Nantucket Land Bank with a notice of intent uh, requesting to uh, create a trail that runs from Surfside Road down My Comet Road along Land Bank land, um, as Ashley just, Miss Aaron Arisman just said, along 13579 15 and 15A Mayakamet Road. Uh, those are the various parcels that go all the way down and along the pond that the land bank owns. Uh, the impetus to put this trail in is that Mayakamet Road is uh, heavily trafficked and relatively unsafe for pedestrians, but there is no sidewalk and uh, no bike path or any way to actually get off the road. So uh, we've been asked to put a trail in that would allow safe passage along this section at least. And then, you know, maybe further down with time, uh, but that would be more of a town project. The wetland delineation um, shows that there's actually two wetlands. There's one on the north side of Otakomi Road. And um, this is an area where I have received um, significant, I've received comments from abutters and I had a really interesting discussion with an abutter yesterday such that um, we will be asking to continue tonight for a variety of reasons. But one of them is that I think we're planning to reroute this section of the trail. So it's actually outside of the 100 foot buffer. Um, we were thinking that it would be less impact to use the existing deer trails, but uh, the neighbors feel that they're so heavily used by deer that we should leave the deer trails to be deer trails and that we should actually move the trail away. So I think that's, that's what we'll do up in here. Um, we were trying to choose the path of least impact, um, <clears throat> but after listening to about our concerns, it sounds like the path of least impact is actually moving it closer to Maya Comet Road. Um, so basically, if you drew a straight line almost between those two red lines, instead of dipping down towards the wetland, um, that is where the, the revised trail will go, but I will be submitting additional information for that. Um, after you cross Otakomi Road, the trail is proposed to run along Maya Com the edge of Maya Comet Pond. And um, again, this is an area where we're in very close proximity to the wetland um, buffer. In fact, the trail is right on the wetland line um, by the very end. Uh, and that is basically the edge of the pond. There's also significant topography here. So basically you have, have a pretty sharp drop off um, from the edge of the road down into the pond. Um, in terms of other factors environmentally that play in to, or come into play on this property, um, we just have Jeff's just kind of scrolling through additional wetland delineation slides because we broke them out and zoomed them in. Um, if you go down, uh, there's a FEMA flood map, but um, more to my concern would be that this does actually overlap slightly with natural heritage habitat. So we have filed with um, natural heritage, their estimated habitat and are waiting to hear back from them. Um, I would be pleased to answer any questions. Um, I just to give you a little bit of idea of construction is we're really thinking a single track trail. So 
um, not much wider than three feet. And the goal is to avoid as much um, vegetation as we can uh, while providing safe passage for the public along this way. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so we'll open it up uh, to commissioners for questions or comments. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I understand the intention of wanting to use the existing deer trail, uh, but I agree with the abutter homeowner you talked to that it makes more sense to reroute this trail um, outside of the 25 foot buffer across the entire site. You're still gonna have very good wetland views there, but you're gonna minimize people, um, you know, encroaching off the trail, single track trail, three feet, especially if there's natural gaps or openings, people are gonna get curious and they're gonna walk right into the, the wetland itself and it's a safety issue and a resource area issue. So moving it farther back is probably beneficial for multiple perspectives. Uh, I do know you have to cut more vegetation that way, but I think in this case, it is the right thing to do. Thank you, Seth, for that comment. Um, I have to agree with you, Maureen. Um, yes, um, and <clears throat> I agree with both of you and, and Rachel. I think it's great that you listen to the, the abutters and they had ideas that, that turned out to work better for everybody. And I think that's just a great example of you know, working together with the community and I appreciate you all doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, I have a comment, Madam Chair, as well. Yep, go ahead, Linda. Um, you may have said something. I had to get my brother and my son out of my car for a minute so I could hear. Um, does this address the issues that one of those letters had with the intersection with Otakami and the unsafe um, dumping people out there? Does, that, does moving this address that issue? It does not. Um, I will add that this is... Unfortunately, this is an area that people drive really quickly and uh, we have brought it to the attention of the Traffic Safety Advisory Board. Uh, both the intersection of Surfside and My Comet Road and the Otokomi intersection and they reviewed it and said that they felt that there wasn't um, I, I don't know, either there wasn't an issue or it wasn't significant enough to um, warrant a, a separate resolution. Um, so that is as far as we were able to go with that. Um, unfortunately, this does not address that issue um, as I don't exactly know how to. Maybe increasing visibility through you, Madam Chair, increasing visibility on that corner. Um, there's a lot of pine trees and vegetation around those, that particular intersection, maybe reducing it because the layout of my Comet Road is very wide. And a lot of that vegetation is actually in the roadway layout. It's not just the 18 feet that's paved. So potentially that could be rectified by just increasing some visibility on there, that, that intersection. We could certainly increase visibility, like sight lines. Um, we've done that in a number of different areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would, that would, when you come back next, I'd love to see that sort of okay. resolved. Yep. Thank you for bringing that um, up, Linda. Um, Seth, I saw your hand come up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Linda, because you reminded me of something I was gonna say as well. Um, this isn't going to solve the problem of traffic. I um, mean, if anything, it's putting the burden on the wrong person. But if at the intersection with the Otakomi Road, where the trail is on each side, there could be something more than like, more than just the path ending, some type of visual barrier, like a post or a rock or a, a gate somehow that indicates to the person 
okay, I'm walking and I'm about to cross a road. Um, really, it's the, it's the cars who should be responsible for the traffic safety, not the pedestrians. But people are going to be out walking in this nice uh, wooded environment. They might you know, be in their own mind thinking about whatever. And a visual obstruction or barrier is going to bring them back centered a little bit and make it indicative that there's a traffic hazard ahead. So I'd like to see that. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion, suggestion Seth. I was going to say some sort of signage, but I know nobody likes actual signage for the most part on Nantucket. Um, I, I realize that this corner is a really bad corner. I'm um, hoping that with like the Surfside sewer construction, it'll slow down a little bit because I think people were flying through there using it as a cut through um, over the past um, nine months or so, which is, has made it worse. But um, I agree some sort of visual barrier I think would be helpful. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, looks like not from commissioners, so we'll open this up for uh, public comment. Doesn't look like we have public comment on YouTube at this point. Uh, so maybe we just have members of the public watching, uh, but if you're watching uh, and you'd like to comment on wetlands aspects of this, uh, please do. Uh, Seth? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. There was a few people at the beginning of the meeting that indicated they had comments on this. I don't know if they're on YouTube, I'm not sure if they're still on or not. Yeah, I, I just saw that. They haven't actually made a comment, but I think they maybe received um, their abutters notices and, and uh, were tuning in. Uh, but if they would like to comment, they are welcome to. It, it looks like they're coming in. Yeah. Um, so Susan J. Berman uh, writes that she's concerned about safety also at the end of the trail as people either enter Maya Comet Road or those crossing Maya Comet Road to the trail uh, to South Shore Road. Um, and then uh, Catherine Raphael writes, uh, I love land bank properties. I use them regularly, but this new proposal makes no sense to me. If the land bank has concerns for people using Maya Comet Road, uh, they could cut back bushes on their uh, property. And that looks like all that we have at this point. Um, so we'll give it another minute. Any final commissioner's comments? And this will have to uh, continue for a number of reasons. So if uh, the public you know, did not get to comment tonight, you will uh, still have a chance uh, during next meeting. Jeff? Yeah, I was just gonna also say, if people do have comments, especially since this is gonna get continued, feel free to submit them in writing to the office here in advance. You can find our information on the town website uh, under Natural Resources or Conservation Commission. Um, and we're happy to pass those comments along to commissioners and make sure that people have those in advance. We do ask if people at all possible can have comments and things in on the, uh, you know, the Thursday before the meeting to make sure that they make it up onto the, the, the TAD website with enough time for everyone to review. Um, so that would be the, the Thursday before the, the meeting on the 18th. So it'd be like the 11th. Thank you, Jeff, for that reminder. Um, it looks like we have one more comment from uh, Catherine Raphael. Um, I use the trail every day from Maya Comet Road to South Shore Road. Um, increased traffic would be dangerous. Uh, so again, I think a lot of these questions have to do with um, public safety of trail users um, interacting with uh, vehicles. Um, all right, so if that is the last kind of comment or question. Um, Rachel, are you ready to continue this? Yes, please. May we continue for two weeks? Um, so we have a three-week gap. Oh, three weeks, yes. Um, but the next meeting will be on November 18th. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, and that moves us on uh, in the meeting. We don't have uh, amended orders tonight, no RDAs, no minor mods. So we'll move on to certificates of compliance. Uh, and we'll start with Cunahan uh, at 11 Swain Street. Sure, so 11 Swain Street was uh, for the relocation and elevation of an existing house and construction of an addition. Uh, upon our site inspection, we found that the site was in compliance and would recommend the issuance of that order of conditions, or that certificate of compliance. Whew. It's not even that late yet. I know, it's just one of those days after we're recovering from the nor'easter. Blew our brains sure. around. Um, are there any questions about this application? And if not, uh, is there a motion to issue the cert? Uh, Mark? So moved. Second. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you. Mark got the motion. Linda got the second by roll vote. Uh, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that uh, carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Mainsail LLC at Three Pops Lane. Three Pops Lane was for the expansion of the deck and managing some vegetation. <coughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, to right. manage that, we did our site inspection on the site in Mattica and found that it was also in compliance and we'd recommend the issuance of that for earth conditions. Thank you, Jeff. If there are no questions about this application, would somebody like to make a motion to issue the cert? So moved. All right, motion made by Linda. Is there a second? Seconded by Maureen. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. And that moves us on to SDW Meadow LLC at 18 Meadow Lane. Yes, one second. Yep, this is the one I thought it was. So this one, it also involved uh, kind of the development of a site and the installation of the pool. Uh, we found this site to be in compliance, but we're recommending uh, Conditions 19, 20, 21, and 22 be listed as ongoing conditions as they relate to the regular maintenance of the pool. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, are there any uh, questions about this application? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to issue the certificate with ongoing conditions 19, 20, 21, and 22? So moved. Motion made by Linda. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Seth. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and I, I feel like I pronounce this one wrong every time, but Linda's here to correct me. So DBSCO. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to recuse from this one. <laughs> um, every time I mess Close it. Close enough. Yeah, 39, 39 Meadowview Drive, uh, and Linda's recused. Uh, so this was one we just issued a few weeks ago, and it was for the removal of the shed. Uh, on that site, the shed has been removed, and the site has been restored, and we're recommending the issuance of that certificate of compliance. Okay, so if there are no questions for Jeff, is there a motion to issue? Uh, motion made by Mark. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Maureen, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Right, so that carries with Commissioner Williams recused. Uh, and that moves us on to more trustees at 8 Sachem Road. Yes, this is kind of an old one from uh, 2000. This was for the development of the site for the construction of the home <coughs> with the original permits. Um, we found the site to still be in compliance and would recommend that it's issued as well. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, if there are no questions from commissioners, is there a motion to issue the cert? So moved. Motion made by Linda. Is there a second? Seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? 
Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to orders of conditions. So Jeff sent these out earlier. Uh, and I believe we're going to begin with Anchiline Properties LLC at 19 East Creek Road. Give everyone a chance to get them open, including me. So this was one that we closed last time um, for, for people to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it was for the development of the site that's behind the island home, for those that don't remember, the one that's kind of below that bank. Um, that we had talked about quite a bit. So some of the conditions that I had, I'm not sure that there's going to be a lot after they had removed the uh, the, the pergola and some of the other questions for that, that they had had. I included our new condition for fill. I feel like when they move it around, there may be a little bit that they have to bring in. And on that site, I think it's especially important. Um, and then they're doing quite a bit of planting for those that remember kind of on the Western side of the site. Um, to restore some of those areas, some replanting and survivorship requirements, no cultivars, uh, invasive species removal. Um, and then I thought it would, a good condition in this case might also involve some sort of permanent marker to mark those restored areas so they're not disturbed again. And then uh, I feel like sites that are that close have a tendency for debris to kind of collect in and around those, those areas as well, just to have that removed. Uh, but other than that, I'm open to suggestions uh, above and beyond what was already talked about in the, the minutes for these came from. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know um, in between our last two meetings, I was thinking about this one and I didn't remember in their um, application if they had any information about like storm preparation. So I wasn't sure if we needed a condition like construction materials be moved or somehow um, really secured if there is flooding or a storm predicted? Let me just double check. I know Paul submitted a uh, construction protocol. So we have the no heavy machinery. Construction materials will be stored in driveway or inside garage. Uh, I mean, I think that would be a simple one that all construction materials are to be stored within the garage. And then if there's a storm, it's at least in the garage. Yeah, I think that would be good. And like, yeah, um, just because it is, it's right on the creeks there. This was the one with the pergola, which got removed. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then just to kind of run through really quickly again, Ashley, just to add in. So there, it, it'll have a covered dumpster for any waste storage that's there. Uh, netting will be installed around the perimeter of the house to catch any fallen debris. Uh, they'll do site cleanup on a daily basis. And then uh, sill fencing will be installed as shown on the plan of record. So, so we do. I did include, sorry, I didn't mention it before, that there was a condition 27 to do a spring and fall inspection of that site with commission staff. Um, until all the work is done, just to kind of do a, a check-in and check-in on the plants, so. Thank you, Jeff. Madam Chair, a question? Yes, Linda. Through you. Um, that is such a sensitive site. I know we've got stuff off that we didn't like, that was more detrimental. Are the conditions for construction, and there's gonna be quite a lot of it, and it's exposed to the Northeast. Are the conditions that are in the order of conditions enough to protect anything from creeping into the creeks, uh, flying off it, moving around? I just, it, it was quite a, quite a feat when they put the house there. This is gonna be a lot of construction on this thing. Do we have anything else we can add to protect the creeks and the surrounding wetlands? Or we have enough in here? Um, I mean, I, I think that's a valid question. Um, I mean, Jeff just read through some of the construction details. I know I, I mentioned I'm concerned um, in a, a storm event that that site be secured. Um, and I think, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, it's going to be the onus of the daily workers there um, to actually be keeping up with the site. So I don't know if 
they should submit photos. I'm up for ideas there from from commissioners. So uh, thank you for bringing yeah, that. That's, that. That does concern me about the diligence of some of the construction crews. I'm not I'm not aware of who the contractor is on this one. I just know that, you know, one foot here or there, it's in the creeks. Um, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, having s sat on um, a few different ideas for this property, it's it's been a, a miracle they've made it this far, I think. Uh, Seth, your hand yeah. was up. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at one of the meetings, we talked about requiring the use of non-reflective glass. Um, that maybe that's in the record, but can we just have a condition that says that? Yes, and I can spell that. So just to condition 29, all glass installed shall be non-reflective glass. <clears throat> uh, thank you for mentioning that, Seth, because I think it is important, you know, called out as a condition in this case. Uh, any other um, additions, questions, comments from commissioners? Um, I know something that just I questioned on this one, uh, but probably isn't part of the order. I mean, I'm picturing construction vehicles parking at that land bank parking lot. So, um, you know, something to, to look out for, um, you know, in, in the future. Um, well, here, how, I, I have a quick thought, sorry to interrupt. Um, maybe a 30 that uh, prior to the start of work, contractor, um, Applicant's representative. The commission staff shall meet on site to review all construction activities and protocols. Madam Chair, is that a construction management meeting before they begin construction? Wouldn't that be appropriate? Yeah, so I think that's what Jeff is writing out, that they're going to meet uh, with staff to review protocol. Yeah, they're going to manage the site. Yep. All right, so... Condition 30, uh, prior to the start of work, the contractor, applicant's representative, and commission staff shall meet on site to review all construction activities and protocols. This meeting shall include developing a storm readiness plan to ensure the site is secured properly to avoid impacts to resource areas. Thank you, Jeff. Good suggestion, Linda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was excellent. <clears throat> Any other um, additions, thoughts on this one? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to issue as amended? I'll make that motion with those changes. Okay, uh, is there a second? Seconded by Mark, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, I. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank you for your wordsmithing on the fly, Jeff. Uh, and that moves us on um, to Lloyd Realty LLC at 7 Heather Lane. Yes.
I included our fill condition. And then other than that, I couldn't really think of, of much for this one, but I'm totally open to suggestions. I know, um, yeah, Seth had, had one earlier. So Seth, uh, you, you say it. <laughs> um, uh, Seth had just talked about the drainage from the patio draining away from the coastal bank. Yeah. So we'll put condition 20. And also no vista pruning is allowed by this order. Any other thoughts on this one while Jeff is um, adding some conditions? No. All right, so uh, condition 20, uh, the patio shall be pitched to drain away from the coastal bank or runoff collected and infiltrated outside of the 50 foot setback. And then 21, no vista pruning is allowed by this one. Yes. Um, so if there are no other uh, additions, is there a motion to issue as amended? I'll, I'll make move that as amended. Oh. I'll second. All right. So Mark gets the motion, Linda the second. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. And that moves us on to 22 Easton Street, LLC at 22 and 24 Easton Street. Yeah, so this, this draft is gonna look a little different um, real quickly. So obviously from the permit overview uh, where it said pool, that has been removed. So now the permit overview just says an existing dwelling with guest house, studio, garage patios, decks, hardscaping, and driveway with associated granny landscaping and utilities within land subject storm flowage um, and the buffer zone to Coastal Bank. I don't know, Jeff, should we re remove yeah. landscaping just because they said yeah. they were gonna come back in with that? So if we don't yeah. include landscaping in the permit overview description, we can't do it as a minor modification. Okay. So. Hold on to that thought, and when I get down further, uh, I'll, I'll explain that again. So um, then in the additional finding section, there'll now be a number two that says the commission finds that the pool as shown on the plan of record is not permitted by this order, just to, to call that out. And then uh, the conditions have changed. The fill condition is still there uh, as number 20, and then the pool conditions are all out, and there's a new condition 19 that says the applicant shall file a a final landscape plan with a species list for the commission to review as either a minor modification request or an amended order of conditions request. Okay. But okay. if we don't include landscaping in the overview, mm -hmm. it forces it to be an amended order and takes away the opportunity to do a minor modification new scope of work. Okay. And they'll have to do an amended order for the pool aspect. Correct. Or, or, or a new filing, whatever they prefer to do for whatever reason. Or they could simply just say, we're happy with what we have and never mind the pool. All right, thank you uh, for going, working through that, Jeff. Um, any other thoughts on this one? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to issue as amended? I'll make that motion issue as amended. All right, motion made by Linda. Mark, were you just seconding? Okay, I'll is there second. second by Maureen? Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Eat Fire Spring Trust 2018 at 12 Margaret's Way. Yes, this one seemed pretty straightforward. I apologize for not putting it in, I meant to. Uh, but I've been adding it kind of to all of our applications now that there'd be the condition 19 uh, with our fill condition. 
since they're going to be doing some excavation work potentially with this. Um, but other than that, I didn't really have any conditions for it. Okay. Um, any thoughts from commissioners or is there a motion to issue um, as amended with that fill condition? I'll we'll make that motion. Um, so Linda gets the motion. Maureen, I'll give you the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to uh, Sandra B. Finley at 26 Eel Point Road. Yes, this order looks almost just like the last one with a different permit with you, the same conditions. This is one we approved tonight. That's the local only filing uh, with no waivers and everything that's outside of 50 feet. Seems fairly straightforward. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any uh, amendments or questions on this one? And if not, is there a motion to issue as drafted? Motion to issue as drafted. Right, motion made by Linda. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Maureen, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Real quickly, fun piece of information, that filing when it was done in 2004, I actually was the project representative that permitted that originally. It's weird to see projects come back without a lot of changes, a little blast from the past for me tonight, so. As the world turns over here. <laughs> Never get away. Um, Mark, do you have a question, comment? I have a question for Jeff. Jeff, how easy, how easy is it to get a soil test? If we're talking about fill, where does that come from and how long does it take? Soil tests, depending on what you're testing for, I, honestly, you can go and collect the soil you'll need in about 30 minutes um, if you go slow. And then depending on what you're testing for, you can get those soil tests usually back in no longer than like a week to 10 days. They're pretty quick. And most soil testing too is not crazy expensive. No, I know I had to soil test for the landscape properties I managed and it was pretty easy um, to send off and collect. Yeah, if people need help or guidance on that too, um, I've probably taken a few hundred in my day, happy to help out or can send people resources to do that. Most of the landscapers out here I know uh, have at least seen how to do it through their fertilizer training, it's something that they see how to do. Um, so everyone should be able to find a resource to do that or if they need connected with a lab or somewhere that can do it, they're happy to, to do that as well. Thank you for that question, Mark, and the information, Jeff. Um, all right, so we have no extension orders tonight, so that moves us on to other business. We have approval of minutes from October 7th. Uh, thank you, Terry, as always, for the minutes. Um, did anybody see anything that needs to be um, amended or changed? And if not, is there a motion to issue as drafted? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second by Mark. Oh, by Seth. There we go. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. And again, thank you, Terry, for the minutes. Uh, that moves us on to monitoring reports. I don't think we had any um that i saw so we'll go on to um commissioner reports crack is not here uh cpc oh jeff real quickly for for ian and, and uh on crack for those who haven't seen I'll, I'll send it out or i'll send the link is the final coastal resiliency plan uh just issued in the last like 24 to 48 hours uh from arcadis so i would definitely encourage everyone to Check that out and see what's in there. Um, I'll send the link around again. I know we were waiting for Florencia to get it posted and uh, make sure all the links were working and things, but um, that's kind of the big milestone project for, for crack. So I at least wanted to get them recognized that they uh, got that out, got it on time. And I'll even say, knock on wood, it looks like it's even going to be within budget. So that's always, always pluses. So kudos to those guys. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mark? What's the, what's the easy access, Jeff, for that? 
Um, if you just go onto the town webpage and just in that search box, type in coastal resiliency, it, it comes right up. Like I said, once it once it's up, I'm pretty sure it is. I'll, I'll send the link around for everyone as well. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so report from CPC. Um, we have completed our, our interview process and our awards process. And we have, I think we are drafting the uh, uh, town warrant for the uh, town meeting in, in the spring. So we're essentially done with the interviews and the awards. Thank you, Mark. Um, so that will move us on to NP and EDC. Um, we, our meeting is next Monday. So we, I, we haven't had a meeting since our last meeting. That's just what I'm saying. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Uh, so that moves us on to commissioner's comments. Uh, are there any commissioner's comments at this point? Just to clarify, Madam Chairman, um, our meeting with the select board is this Monday, November 1st, at what time again? 4.30, I believe, is what it was scheduled for. 4.30 is correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm just checking because we're coming back from New Jersey tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. It's not it's executive, right? It's just... No, it's an open. No, it's open. No. I'll confirm. It, it's open session. I, I don't know if the, the select board are intending to take uh, public comment during that meeting, but I know it's an open session to the public that anyone can view and uh, watch on YouTube or, or log in through the Zoom webinar. Um, but again, it's Monday at 4.30, and, and I, I also will confirm to everybody, too, that uh, town council will not be present. It's meant to be a discussion between the select board and the CONCOM and not staff and staff or council. It's seven of you and the five of them and discussing that, that matter. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Seth? Is there public comment or is it close to the public? It's open to the public yet. to view. Um, I think it will be at the discretion of the boards of whether they're going to be taking public comment or not. Hmm. But I think you guys will might a, discuss a, that at touch. It's a public meeting. It's a public meeting, not a public hearing. So it is up to the chairman. So um, I guess we will see um, what the select board or Jason uh, intends to do there. Um, so I know I had um, a few comments. Um, one, I asked Jeff to add um, an executive session because I was worried we were backing up against um, a deadline next week. Um, so I'm not sure um, if we need it tonight, um, but um, I wanted to make sure it was available to us, Jeff. You want me to give a little update on that? I know I sent an email on to everybody but would you like me to clarify any of that for, for anyone? Sure, I think it would probably be good even for members of the public to understand uh, some of the deadlines before us. Sure, so there's been some question as it relates to the uh, active appeal on the GeoTube removal order on the enforcement action on where that sits for time deadlines and things. And just to kind of clear this up, I uh, went down Physically, I traded some emails, but physically down to the clerk of courts to get this all confirmed and cleared up and once and for all and, and took every piece of paper that they had uh, for you guys to see it and get a hold of. So currently where we are is there's been a filed amendment uh, that I sent around to everybody where the, the parties named have changed uh, to date. And I even confirmed it before our meeting today. Uh, I have not been served on your guys' behalf, and I'm not aware of any of you being served uh, individually in, in, in your capacity, uh, the official paperwork for it yet. Uh, when I checked on the Mass Court site, uh, there was no proof of service or anything there, so just to confirm that there's not something missing or, or lost in translation. So uh, they do have, from the date of filing, uh, the tracking order that I sent to you guys, obviously, they have until the part of early December to physically serve uh, the paperwork to us as the, the, the commission. From that day, that's when that starts the, the 21 days for, for response upon actual service of the, the complaint, not uh, the filing it with the courts. So until we serve, there's no clock running other than the clock for them to uh, actually serve us that paperwork. So for whatever reason, they are choosing to have it filed probably to meet their 
uh, their deadline for, for filing the appeal, meeting that deadline, and then holding it till I guess they feel that uh, they're prepared to serve that and start the kind of the actual clock running on everything. So uh, there's no pending deadline that I am aware of uh, at this point. I confirmed that with the clerk of courts. Uh, so I'm comfortable in saying that we're not at risk of defaulting or, or doing anything yet for, for lack of response. So uh, I'm happy to address any questions. I know one of the things I included in that email was also uh, this case-specific tracking number, that weird 2175CV00030 number. Uh, if you go to masscourts.org, you can find the, the track, track your case feature there. Use that number and you can see any new information that's been filed, any updates, any amendments, any changes. Uh, all of it's publicly available, so anyone can check it out at any time. Thank you for that update, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions for Jeff? Uh, Mark? So it sounds like we don't necessarily have to go into executive session tonight. Am I reading that right? I, I don't think we need it, no. So I will say to, to Ashley's defense, when we originally came to put it up, uh, it was also just in front of the select board meeting that was a question. And given the 48 hour requirement, uh, I had suggested it's better to post it and then not have it and cancel it than to want it and need it and not have the ability to actually do it. So uh, I, I think that was probably the prudent path, but I would agree that I'm not sure that there's a lot to discuss at this point. Thank, thank you, Jeff, for doing that. Um, Maureen? Yeah, and, and once um, it was clear that the meeting with the select board is an open meeting, that became less important in my view for us to need to have a, an executive session before that meeting. So that meeting's going to be open. So, you know, that's, that makes me feel more comfortable with the whole process. And again, Jeff, thank you so much for being so diligent about figuring out all the ins and outs of the filing deadlines and the rest of it. Right. No problem. I appreciate that. I'm sure it's always all. nice to go visit Barry. She's so nice. So. Um, so I just had one more commissioner's comment uh, and it's about um, kind of a permit violation that I saw this week. Jeff, I don't know if uh, hmm. you or staff has been able to check it out, but um, when I was out at uh, Pacamo, and I think it's no surprise at this point that I walk at Pacamo a lot, um, this past weekend, uh, multiple pieces of heavy machinery had actually left from the point to access um, the newer Wilkinson project down by like Loretta Lane. So they would have had to tra travel like close to a mile um, oh. on the beach and over marshes. Um, so I emailed some pictures to Jeff um, this weekend and I must admit, um, I was like seething as I uh, walked over there, cause that's normally my peaceful walk, but um, in seeing lots of um, machinery and new construction. So I don't know if you guys had been out there, but they had kind of buttoned up that structure like it was done. They vegetated the top, had their erosion control blanket and the machineries actually opened it back up to add new core rolls um, to the structure. So, uh, I just wanted to kind of bring that to the public's attention uh, and ask Jeff if he's uh, been able to check that out. So short answer to that question is yes, we have checked it out. Uh, it was actually kind of nice for those who don't know, uh, we have started our new coastal resources technician position that's here. Uh, her name's Morgan Sale and she's been out on multiple sites. She's been really busy post storm here. Uh, doing site inspections and kind of inventorying these structures. Um, so we were able to go out and she was able to get out and kind of photograph some of these areas uh, and put together kind of a, a rough report on some of them. Uh, we'll definitely have that uh, as well as I submitted a draft report to some people in the Pacamo area related to the Pacamo neighbors thing for them to review. And we'll have that to you guys for your next meeting for discussion. And we'll have that, the other report that Ashley's asked about uh, wrapped up in advance for you guys to read photographs and to see those things in advance uh, to go forward from there. But we're very happy to have someone started. So when Ashley called, we were able to get to it right away. 
So it was kind of nice to be able to do, and it's been great to have. What was the name uh, again, Jeff? I, uh, her I name is Morgan Sale. Sale. Yeah. Thank you. So she was at the she was with the trustees of the reservation for for a little period of time, and has uh, moved with us now. And uh, I think this is her third week, second week, third week. Uh, but it's been great. S A Y L E. Yes. But um, she is sales part of the Sale family from Nantucket. Yes. Of one of the, I'm not sure of which branch always, but uh, definitely part of one of them. Uh, but it's just been nice. Just post storm alone, we were able to cover between she, Vince, and I, um, and mostly Vince and Morgan, um, a lot more sites than we normally do, a lot more photographs. One of the things that she's been working on right off the jump here is for those who remember, WPI did a kind of an inventory of all coastal engineering structures, uh, and that was current to really about 2015. Um, She's updated that pretty much to current with everything else that's in there. And um, I think it's our intention and her intention to make sure that every one of those structures gets inspected at least monthly, kind of going forward through the winter. And then the active sites uh, may be as frequent as, as every other week, uh, just to kind of document and photograph and see what's going on. Um, and then as we get start work notifications or notifications of nourishment activities or things happening, uh, she's able to respond and get out there and, and get out there when sand is getting delivered and, and put on the site to make sure that high water stakes are in, that the material doesn't look weird or full of debris. So it's uh, nice to have kind of a full-time inspector position for coastal specialty projects uh, right now. It's been great. And that's only the third week. So lots of time to improve and do things, but uh, it, it's been a lot of work off of uh, Vince and I in the, the short term, so it's been nice to have. Thank you for checking all that out and hiring Morgan and getting her going on this stuff. It sounds like she's hit the ground running. In my cheesy government speak, I would say thanks to town meeting for approving the budget that she was included within, so. Uh, Mark? Yeah, it's just, um, Jeff, is, is there an issue with 88 and 90 uh, Pacama with the uh, request for those quad rolls versus the sand fence there that's been, it's been postponed for months now. Uh, I think the applicant, I, I don't want to put words in their mouth. I, I think they're trying to decide if they need to redesign the project or if they are redesigning the project. Um, I don't think there's an issue as far as um, from our end, but I think after the kind of initial discussions and information that's come in, they're trying to uh, decide if it's their best option to pursue. Thank you. That's my nice way of saying that. I have to leave the meeting, Madam Chairman. I didn't know if we were adjourning soon, but I have to leave the meeting right now. Okay, um, I think we are adjoin adjoining soon, but I totally understand that you um, need to leave. So thank you for uh, coming and attending while you're uh, off Nantucket. We appreciate that. Well, I have to go save my brother and my son from buying the store out. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't have anything else all to right. add either. So take care, guys. Um all right, Jeff. So that was um all for your administrator staff reports. I think for now. Just as a reminder, our next meeting is in three weeks on the 18th. I'll send a reminder for field view exam for uh the meeting date. Then our next I, I lied. Our next meeting is actually on Monday at 4:30. Uh but our next regular meeting of our regularly scheduled events will be the 18th of November. Okay. And that's our only one in November. And then uh, we have a little break because we're just trying to dodge the holidays. Prior to the next meeting, I will also try to get you guys a uh, draft schedule for 2020, I can't say this, 2022 um, to kind of go forward so we can get that sent to. Oh, good. That sounds great, Jeff. And maybe, um after our select board meeting, I'll come in and we can maybe throw around some potential Saturdays for our regulations. Yeah. Um, to try and get get some dates out there to hopefully get it done. <laughs> yeah. A couple of workshop meetings, I think we'll knock it out pretty fast. Yeah. Um, all right. So if there's nothing more from staff or commissioners, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Second. Um, by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Phillips? Aye. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Oh, real quick. See you all Monday.
Okay. Check your email tomorrow. I'll have things for you guys to sign first thing in the morning. Oh, right. Okay. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Jeff, I meant to ask, what about, have you, do we have a replacement yet? For, for Joanne? Joanne? Um, no, I'll talk about that in more like, it, it's, it's not okay. because okay. we don't want to replace, um, but there's some potential significant changes coming to natural resources that we are trying to sort out. Um, okay. As far as, uh, well, I might as well tell you, we're off the meeting. Anyone that wants to go can go, uh, but since okay. Maureen asked, uh, I've shared this with Ashley before. Um, it's no secret that the select board have been looking to add some level of a sustainability function to the town and kind of starting that and fully intention of kind of having a separate office at some point, probably for it, but to kind of start incorporating, you know, sustainability planning and functions and things into the town. And to start off, they weren't sure how they wanted to do it other than identifying kind of a, a core team of people within the town uh, and then get someone to kind of be the hub of the wheel to do that. Um, good news is I am not the hub of the wheel for that, uh, but they have asked that before it gets broken out into its own department um, to house it in natural resources for a little bit uh, to get it started and, and help them, you know, build kind of the processes, build a budget and kind of put things together uh, over the next couple of years before it might get separated out. That ultimately is the, the plan. Uh, and just to give it a home and some resources. So um, that was the task that was kind of put to me to do. So it involves a little bit of restructuring and some organizing that was uh, kind of necessary and natural resources anyways. Uh, one of the offshoots is I think we're also going to be requesting a dedicated uh, conservation agent position to the commission. So it would be like a full-time dedicated staff person that just does uh, CONCOM work uh, to help supplement uh, what I do and what Vince does and now what Morgan is here to do too, but someone who's uh, here to deal with all of it. So you may not see me all of the time. There may be me, maybe new person or something if that, if that goes through for funding wise. Uh, but in that, since Joanne was doing a lot of that role before, we've kind of redutied her position again and split it back to more of a, a basic office person. But that was some of the delay was kind of sorting that out and trying to figure out if that was really going to kind of move forward and, and kind of get into budget processing and, and those kinds of things. So um, that was a little bit of the delay. And then obviously job descriptions at the town have to go through union process and HR process and all that fun stuff. So um, it's for a good reason. It wasn't because we didn't want to, but we were able to uh, hopefully re reposition a little bit and uh, provide some expanded services and some things that I, I think a lot of us feel are necessary and a lot of coordination between things like, you know, waste management and energy and water quality and coastal resiliency and all these things that work together uh, provide kind of someone to help make sure that those interests are aligned and not competing or if they're competing, how we compromise to, to get it to work and, and, and get it together. And uh, was happy to, you know, get asked if we, we could, take that on here and happy to take the challenge on and hopefully can do some really fun and cool things. So it should be nice. So if it all goes through, we may be looking for a sustainability person and a conservation agent. So people know people if that continues to go yeah. through. Um, It'll be very interesting to see how that plays out, but I, we definitely need, well, the town definitely needs more help in this regard. And so I'm glad that it's being thought about yeah. and considered. So. Yeah. And one of the other positions that's kind of an offshoot that's unrelated to us uh, that we're excited about too is we've also put in for a split position between our office and the health department. That's a health and natural resources kind of specific public information person. So someone to just like maintain our websites and develop materials for, for homeowners and citizens and, uh, to do that because we just, we're asking biologists to do it now. And I, I think Seth will understand this completely when I say it. Uh, a lot of us are not very good at developing materials for people. And some are really talented at it, um, but we have a tendency sometimes to be overly sciencey or, or things that are there. It's a struggle that that all of us have, especially those of us that are older uh, who didn't have to do it as much. But uh, having someone that can be helpful for that for both as we enter into you know resiliency and obviously health is kind of inundated uh, with COVID kind of tailing off a little bit. Uh, we're going to be ramping up on things like PFAS um, and, uh, you know, single-use plastics and those kinds of things that were kicking around before that 
Uh, we have a real high demand for information and it's hard to keep up with and a dedicated person would be super nice to have to, to do that and generate a lot of good material for folks. And Florencia does an awesome job for the town, but she gets kept busy with select board and administration and all the other departments of the town. So hopefully, hopefully all of these things magically go through and we'll be all be better off for it. So we'll see. It definitely helps to have a dedicated communications person for your organization. It, it definitely helped at Lenore and at your foundation. Yeah. So it's, it's good. So hopefully, like I said, hopefully it's there. So if there's ever a chance for people to comment publicly to the finance committee or any of that, uh, your support is always welcome and, and, uh, and encouraged. But with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and we can all <laughs> go home at 7.15. I'm home, but isn't that so like, nice? We'll no. stop. So. Have a good, have a good night, everybody. Night, guys. Night, everybody. Thanks, we'll see you Monday.